So the title of this talk is going to be Treatment Options for BTK Inhibitor Progressors. Here are my disclosures. So the first thing I want to do is to review with updated data what we have on this topic. And this is a topic that we've covered in this meeting uh, almost every year um, for the past couple of years. It is first important to identify whether or not there is a problem, and if there is, what that problem is. So when we look at ibrutinib progression-free survival, and these are data from the 1102 patients, you can see here, as pointed out earlier, that there are definitely a group of patients who progress. The group is smaller for those who are treatment naive over the age of 65 than they are for the relapse refractory patients. What we have below are the progressions based upon the interface fish abnormalities. And you can see from the data here that the 17P deleted and the 11Q deleted patients do fare far worse than the other patients. I would like to point out from subsequent data, uh, we have using less heavily treated patients than these, that the 11Q deleted patients don't fare any worse um, than the other interface fish abnormalities. And that's based upon data that's been published by Jennifer Brown. So really focusing on 17P deletion, that's really the most important predictor we have for people progressing on ibrutinib. And also to show you that this holds true for a calibrutinib. And you can see here that the PFS is actually lower for um, 17P deleted patients compared to all others. I would like to point out that these overall outcomes are not as bad as what we saw with ibrutinib, likely due to patient selection, and of course, patients being a lot less heavily pretreated compared to the original ibrutinib cohort. What I'd really like to also focus on here is looking at 17P deletion, TP53 abnormalities in a treatment-naive cohort. So this is the group of patients from the NIH study which allows us to really look at 17P deletion without the accumulated toxicities and genetic changes that might ensue or result from treatment with chemoimmunotherapy. So in essence, these really are patients who are really sort of the best of 17P deleted patients could be. And what you can see here is that at six years, we actually have a progression-free survival of 61%. So here we have a 40% progression, which is far lower than what we saw with the earlier data, but is still more than what we would obviously like to see with our patients. And this really represents the burden of the problem for treating patients with 17P deletion with single agent BTK inhibitor therapy. A very interesting piece of data regarding these patients is um, obtained when you looked at the TP53 allele loss on the outcomes. So the typical next generation sequencing data is generated using a sensitivity of about five to 10%. Here, using a more sensitive NGS assay, they were able to generate data using a variant allele frequency as sensitive as 0.2%. So looking at the number of allele loss, they really showed that as long as one TP53 allele is intact, you do have normal TP53 function, and actually an excellent outcome on ibrutinib. So this really suggests the importance of the biallelic loss, which is something that is likely accumulates with chemoimmunotherapy, and really the value of starting these patients on novel agents that aren't going to induce genetic changes. And when you look overall at the cumulative discontinuation rate for patients, with CLL progression, you can see here from an entire cohort of patients from OSU that the CLL rate of progression is about 20% at four years. So this gives you a baseline for the group overall and not just the TP53 mutated 17P deleted patients. So is there a problem? Yes. And these are the patients that I think we really need to be most aggressive in addressing how to improve their outcome. So these are patients that we can identify by having TP53 abnormalities. Um, and the first thing that I always want to advocate for is making sure that we're not missing something that might be impacting the efficacy of our drugs. 
So for ibrutinib, there are a lot of drug-drug interactions. We need to make sure that we're not giving the patient something that might activate the CYP3A4 system and cause increased metabolism of ibrutinib and impair its efficacy. For acalabrutinib, we have to make sure that our patients are actually absorbing the acalabrutinib and they're not taking any proton pump inhibitors or other medications that might suppress acid sufficiently to prevent acalabrutinib absorption. So that's a very important thing to make sure of before we declare someone a progressor. But once someone's clearly a progressor, the question is, is what we can do to help them. We don't have a lot of data specifically in ibrutinib progressions, but let me show you the data that we do have. So the two options that have been most extensively studied includes venetoclax as well as CAR T cells. So Jeffrey Jones published venetoclax post ibrutinib looking at a cohort of patients that were post BCR antagonists but assigned based upon the last BCR antagonist that they received. So these were patients who may have received ibrutinib or idelisib at the time, but they were assigned to the cohort depending upon whether or not they received the idelisib blast or the ibrutinib blast. So we had 91 CLL patients that were treated with venetoclax for up to two years. The median follow-up on this population was 14 months. Now all patients had to, dis had to have progressed after discontinuing the ibrutinib. Not all patients progressed on the ibrutinib, um, meaning that many may have stopped ibrutinib for adverse events or stopped ibrutinib because of a completion of therapy reason um, and then progressed. The trial also involved very aggressive screening for Richter's transformation, including PET scanning and biopsy for any lesions that were suspicious with the hope of really making sure that we were still looking at a pure CLL population. As an aside, two patients did receive a dose escalation to 600 milligrams um, because they weren't yet demonstrating a response at 12 weeks to 400 milligrams, but neither escalation resulted in any clinical benefit. Seven patients also re received a rapid dose escalation, which I've outlined below, which is achieving full dose of 400 milligrams by week three. And this is important to keep in mind because we do see patients who progress very rapidly and dramatically after discontinuation of ibrutinib therapy. So here, this is a way to safely be able to rapidly escalate the patients before their disease gets out of control. And looking at the reasons for discontinuation, you can see that 55% of the patients discontinue ibrutinib because of disease progression. And these represent those who progressed while on the ibrutinib. 33% uh, for adverse events, 7% for a plateau in the response, 3% completed therapy, and then 2% were unspecified. In looking at the responses, we see an overall response rate in our population of 65% which includes nine CRs and 55% PRs, 24% of patients had stable disease and five actually demonstrated progression. Importantly, the overall response by reason for ibrutinib discontinuation, namely progressive disease versus adverse event, were 54% and 63% respectively. So regardless of why the patient actually discontinued the ibrutinib, we do seem to be able to generate very nice responses in these patients. But looking at the progression-free survival, you can see here that the median PFS was 24.7 months and a 12-month progression-free survival of 75%. And the overall survival, the median was not reached while the 12-month was 91%. So while we are able to generate responses in a large number of these patients, we still do have disease progression on the venetoclax, and we do have patients succumbing to their CLL. Now, a second cohort looking at patients from the national, the United Kingdom National Health Service, and these were a retrospective analysis of patients who received venetoclax pre-approval. 105 patients that were very heavily treated with three to five prior lines of therapy. And these included patients who got venetoclax post- um, brutin and kinase inhibitor, which was mostly going to be ibrutinib, but not absolutely. Patients who got venetoclax post-PI3 kinase inhibitor, and these were almost exclusively going to be idelisib. 
and patients who received both. And you can see the overall response rate in these patients was much higher, 85% and 92% respectively for post-BTKI and post-PI3 kinase inhibitor with CR rates of 23% and 83% respectively. What's interesting from these data is that if you look at what the patients received previously, either neither BTK or PI3 kinase, um, patients who received BTK inhibitor therapy, patients who received PI3 kinase inhibitor therapy, or both, there really was no difference. And I really wanna just emphasize the patients who were post-BTK inhibitor therapy, post-PI3 kinase inhibitor therapy, or both, that regardless, they all did equally well with their progression-free survival. Now, when we look for the progression-free survival by treatment discontinuation, there was a statistically significant difference here with the patients who discontinued basically due to refractory disease, having a worse outcome by progression-free survival compared to those who actually discontinued therapy for other reasons. I do wanna just add some data looking at venetoclax post idelisib because this was uh, data that was generated from the same study that Jeff Jones's data was done, but this was studied separately. I um, apologize. This was actually published separately uh, by Steve Cutre, and this was a cohort of 36 CLL patients, the median follow-up of 14 months again. Um, all patients progressed after discontinuing the idelisib. And once again, there was aggressive screening for Richter's transformations. And here, two patients did go up to 600 milligrams of venetoclax with one a patient did demonstrate some clinical benefit. And you can see here, the reasons for Idella discontinuation included 36% progressive disease and 61% adverse events. Of course, the adverse event percentage here is far higher than what it was for the Ibrutinib population. And you can see here the overall response rate was 67% with 9% CRs and 58% um, PRs. And the overall, and the difference in the overall response by reason for treatment discontinuation here, you can see was important with a 46% overall response rate in those who discontinued due to progressive disease versus an 82% response rate in those who discontinued due to adverse events. And here you can see the median PFS was not reached, but the 12 month PFS was 79%. So we do have some work to do in these patients who progress both BTK inhibitor therapy. I would like to remark that the data we have generated and the data that I just showed you is really just single agent um, BCL2 antagonist therapy. And of course, a lot of the novel, the newer regimens are all using venetoclax in combination with other agents. So how that might play out differently still remains to be seen. The other option for these patients, which has been investigated is CD19 CART T cells. And here's one study looking at 24 patients, 19 of whom were ibrutinib refractory. They had a median of five prior therapies and the overall response rate was 71% at four weeks, which for CART T cell therapy is when they typically look at the responses. Now, 17 of 21 patients that were assessed had achieved MRD negativity in the bone marrow. The problem is, is even with a high response rate in a large number of people achieving MRD negativity, we still had a median PFS of only 8.5 months. So even though we are generating responses, these responses are very short-lived. And of course, CART T-cell therapy is associated with a significant number of toxicities. So it is important to consider whether or not that's something to be used in this setting. So in conclusion, venetoclax is efficacious post-BTK inhibitor therapy. The data are limited by short follow-up. And I really have to emphasize that there's an important need to be aware of potential rapid progression. And this is something that's been described in the literature. Um, so when you discontinue the BTK inhibitor, you know, the patient should be ready to start their next line of therapy immediately. And really, this means not waiting for them to necessarily have an IWCLL treatment indication. 
Now, combination therapies, which we don't have much data on yet, post-ibrutinib, may afford even better outcomes. And I'd like to point out some of the interesting strategies here, which include just adding venetoclax to ibrutinib. Now, we have a lot of data coming with ibrutinib and venetoclax being used in combination for patients who are treatment naive or ibrutinib naive. But we frequently see patients in our practice who progress on ibrutinib and then add venetoclax. And through this synergy, we're able to induce a very nice response with their residual disease. And this is also a means to help actually initiate their next line of therapy without giving them the chance to rapidly progress from the ibrutinib discontinuation. Uh, we also have data with venetoclax plus anti-CD20 antibody therapy, umbrilisib ublituximab plus venetoclax, or U2-VEN, which is currently being investigated in the national study. And then we have idelisib, and it's certainly important to consider this as an option because the PI3 kinase class of agents is certainly the one other class that we have approved beyond BCL2 inhibitors for patients who progress on BTK inhibitor therapy. And then finally, we're generating a lot of data now with the reversible BTK inhibitors, including LOXO305 and ARQ531. And these agents have the ability to overcome some of the resistance mechanisms for BTK inhibitors. It's unclear whether or not they really work in patients who are refractory to BTK inhibitor therapy and whether or not there's different situations where they may or may not work. So most of the data that we currently have with these agents is in patients who have progressed after ibrutinib and not been truly BTK refractory. Thank you.